Good morning. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, um, my name's Wade Conlon with Hanson Professional Services. Uh, this is Jonathan Norsey. We're going to be presenting uh, Commissioning Airport's uh, pre- and post-inaugural flight. Uh, interesting bit is I actually did fly out of this terminal while uh, a good section of our team was actually in the field testing air handling units. Um, so it really does mean pre- and post-inaugural flight. Uh, this is for the CEUs. Go ahead and uh, get your smartphone out, get into the schedule, check yourself in, that way you get credit for your PDHs being here, and you can give a review only if they're kind though, please. Uh, copyrighted materials. Uh, this is a course description, which is what you've probably already read and decided to come here, unless you just came to Heckle, which is just as well. Um, these are learning objectives that are submitted to make sure that we get the PDHs. And then this is the real reason we're here. We're going to go over an overview of the airport areas. It is not just one little building. Um, there's a lot of different systems to commission. Uh, we are going to get into the functionality of testing a central energy plant with minimal load, and we do mean minimal. Um, talk about some different issues that we came across just dealing with the multiple buildings, single project. Jonathan's going to really dig into that. And we're going to touch on resiliency, uh, just a touch, and we have done this and hopefully there's enough time for a lot more questions and answers, which uh, hopefully gets to be the interesting piece. Okay, thanks, Wade. Um, so for those of you who've flown into Orlando and parked down the south side of the airport, uh, this little map will be somewhat familiar. What you see depicted on the right side of the map uh, uh, with the green tag on it is the the light rail train station, which runs between the north and south terminals, and the what you sh we see shown in pink, the uh, the train station and the adjacent parking garage phase one was built out in an earlier phase, and the, this latest project, South Terminal C, adds to that uh, ground transportation facility, which acts as a basically a transitional building from the automated people mover over to the land side and the air side terminals, and. On the north uh, side of the parking garage, there was uh, an expansion of the parking structure, which, as we know, you always need more parking spaces in the airport. So uh, they, they built out the parking garage uh, bigger as part of the South Terminal C project. North of that, you'll see uh, a new central energy plant that was built uh, to serve South Terminal C. And at the north end of the site is the emergency power generation building. Um, What I do? What did you do? Hey, I must have done something. Okay, wrong wrong arrow. Sorry. Um, so commissioning an airport is uh, is interesting in that you'll see systems that you normally wouldn't see in an office building or other types of projects. Like for example, um, it's 95 degrees out. You have a jet parked at the at the gate. Uh, in between flights, how do you keep the, how do you keep it cool? So part of this design included uh, a preconditioned air system, which consists of preconditioned air units located at each gate uh, to cool the planes. And uh, they're served by a low temperature glycol chill water system. And there is a satellite uh, chill water plant in the airside terminal that serves those units through that system. Dedicated outdoor air, it's, uh, it's central Florida, very hot, humid climate. Uh, so. Uh, it really made sense to incorporate dedicated outdoor air systems. Uh, there's energy recovery wheels within these units, and basically they provide preconditioned air to the air handling units that uh, basically decouple the latent load uh, for the outdoor air from the sensible load and just helps the, the whole, all the systems operate more efficiently. Uh, not necessarily unique to an airport, but uh, a very good feature they incorporated. Uh, in the airside terminal, they were designed in such a way that the mechanical equipment rooms were located uh, with an exterior doors, a set of exterior doors that lead straight out to the jetways. So you, have, you could have jets idling outside, and these rooms were designed initially, uh, well, they were designed as a, basically where the room serves as a, an outdoor air, return air mixing plenum, and they were initially designed by the engineer to be slightly negative pressure, and we, we've kind of had concerns about that. Obviously, we don't want to ingest jet fumes, get them into the MER, because then they end up in the terminal at large. So we facilitated meetings with just us and the, uh, the BAS contractor and the engineer of record, and we figured out how to 
tweak the sequences of operation. So to main, and they agreed that this was a good idea to maintain the mechanical equipment room slightly positive. So that in turn required some creative um, programming on the part of the BAS contractor basically to uh, uh, modulate the spill air dampers and the variable speed return fans in such a way that we can maintain 0.02, very slight positive pressure, uh, keep the jet fumes out of the mechanical equipment rooms. Um, the project, that, uh, as you saw on the map at the north end, includes a very robust uh, emergency power generation uh, system. Uh, it consists of seven four megawatt diesel generators. Uh, the photos may not may do them justice, but these are 20 cylinder locomotive diesels. Uh, uh, pretty impressive just to stand next to. But uh, the interesting part of this design is that it, they're sized not just for basic emergency lighting or life safety systems in the south terminal, but it, basically most of the south terminal can be tar carried by this plant, including the baggage handling system, lights, fans, and other uh, systems, which Wade is going to get into uh, talking to you about in a second here. So, chiller plant, um, it's pretty big. It is, you know, as you see on the screen, that's the image on the right hand side. It is a series counterflow chiller plant. Um, it is variable primary. You can see the different chillers there. There are seven. Um, there are, uh, uh, <laughs> they're not equally sized, right? Because they're considered upstream and downstream chillers, very typical that you see in a series counterflow. Um, and, but I said there are seven, we'll get into that a little bit later on. Uh, four chilled water pumps, you only need three. Um, four cooling towers with three cells each, but technically per the load, you only need three. And then, um, the, uh, yeah, that serves three different loops leaving the plant. And uh, those loops, as you can see, the pipe size is there. So in essence, this plant is an N plus one redundancy um, built in for a little bit of resiliency. And uh, I'm going to show you the next picture, which essentially is the cooling tower lineup and everything else, just so you know that I wasn't lying about the equipment that's in this plant. But uh, um, pretty impressive, but when you talk about a chiller plant, you really want to talk about how does a chiller plant actually work? What was the intended operations for these machines, right? Um, have the sequences up there on the screen, and so uh, with this, there's an upstream and a downstream chiller, right? So obviously, it's one direction is entering chilled water, one direction is entering, the other direction is entering condenser water, and you're going to stage them, and they're, <laughs> they're going to stage them one at a time. Uh, you start with a downstream chiller, um, which is one, three, uh, five, or seven. And uh, once you uh, have a, a need for 80% capacity, more so on that chiller, you're going to start your upstream chiller, which is two, four, or six. And I do mean or. They are not paired. You'll see another diagram later on. They can work interchangeably with each one of them. Um, so uh, <laughs> there's a nice feature here, which, you know, added in, which is that load balancing. So once the second chiller comes on, in essence, the program continually tries to tweak what's going on in the plant to get both the upstream and downstream chiller to be within 5% of its RLA, right? Trying to make sure that you're not just loading up one machine and being a lot less efficient than equally loading between the machines, even though they are different tonnages. Um, then when you get to a downstream lag chiller, call it your third chiller on, um, it's either based on you're not maintaining your water temperature for so long, or, and it's written up there, is you've exceeded the maximum flow of your chillers. So if I were to ask you, what does maximum flow of a chiller mean to you? Is that design? Is that, what is that number? Right. But the submittal should list the design value, which is what you're expecting. And then there's an actually a maximum value on every chiller tube and a minimum value to make sure that you have flow so that it can actually do cooling. So this was a discussion that we had with the engineer to try and confirm that. When we first got out there, the BAS technician said they used the design number. Well, we already said later on we're going to talk about chiller plant testing at a low load, which probably means low delta T, which means a lot of extra flow. So we got to see a lot of times where three chillers were operating because they had that design flow. So we met with them, just had discussions, and slowly tweaked that number up to try and minimize that third chiller turning on because um, it, it caused some other issues that we'll get into later. And then finally, your upstream lag chiller is same with the 42 degrees, and then you go on until you get to your six chillers operating. So that's how you turn on your chiller. Fortunately for us, uh, 
good engineer that didn't write the reverse shall recur to turn off your chillers, because we all know that's not possible. Um, and so up here, what we have is how you're going to disable these, right? So when you're uh, uh, lag stream, lag upstream, you're going to disable it. It's essentially you're looking at the excess capacity that you have in the plant and determining whether you need that whole chiller or not. And so it'll turn off your uh, upstream chiller, and then it'll do the same thing for the downstream chiller, in essence, until you get to the minimum number of chillers running. And in, in our experience is, in essence, two chillers were pretty much running all the time, even through trying to test out this chiller plant. So um, the chill water pumps use wire to water efficiency, trying to be as efficient as possible. And uh, interesting to test, but it all worked. And then the cooling towers, the image you can see on the right is, you know, that cooling tower bay that, you know, I said, and it's nothing different than what you would typically do, which is condenser water reset based on ambient between those two temperature ranges. So, um, but so that's the plant. That's how they're intending to operate it. And uh, so let's now talk about some of the, the issues of testing out this chiller plant. Well, the diagram, flow diagram, you can see the different chillers, you can see the lineups. I've already told you that any chiller can work, any upstream can work with any downstream. So when we were looking at it, and you're talking about, and you, you tell your client, we're going to test for every mode, right? Well, what does every mode mean? Does that mean you're looking at upstream and then downstream, or downstream and upstream and then there and again and again? Well, in reality, Jonathan got to sit down and he did all the iterations, and uh, um, you see the number up there. There's 36 different possible configurations of staging of chillers because they can all work with each other. And you say, okay, fine, you can turn the chiller on and that's good. And you can turn on your next chiller and that's good. But remember, when you turn on that second chiller, we've got to hit that 5% RLA. So it wasn't deemed successful because the different runs, different piping runs, different things that went on, it wasn't deemed successful of a lag chiller until it got within that 5% RLA. Some of them we saw within 10 minutes. Some of them took longer than an hour. So it's a lot of, you know, patiently sitting and waiting as you typically do sometimes through that commissioning process. Um, now, flow balance, three chillers running. Um, this was an interesting piece, and, and I'll touch on it. Is, so the original, original pre-design that the owner went out and, and, and got was from an individual uh, in the Orlando area that has done a lot of extremely design of extremely large chilled water plants for utilities. And so in his design, he had a few things, and one of which was that the control valves on the chillers shall be modulating, right? If I've got four in one, one, one section and three on the other and I can have any combination, how do I actually balance the flow, right? If I'm running one and six or if I'm running one and two. And uh, unfortunately, someone accepted through the VE process that these valves could become two position. So um, Justin's about to cringe when I say, yeah, we said, fine, go ahead and balance every one of those scenarios to figure out where the valve should be and, and in essence, where the pump should run depending on chiller configuration. It didn't happen. Um, right now, and we'll get into it a little bit later, but they are switching to uh, modulating valves to try and have that balance. But I'll show you what that was doing to our condenser water system. So the pumps were on VFDs. They were running at 60 hertz and they're designed for 6,000 GPM, right? So when you have series counterflow, each chiller is doing the same 6,000 GPM if you have two chillers running. One, one downstream, one upstream, everything's good. When I turn on that third chiller, it's a downstream, which is where the condenser water hits first. Well, now I have to turn on a second pump because I need, it needs its 6,000. So I technically am trying to move 12,000 GPM through two downstream chillers. They didn't ask for the bypass around any of these sections to be open to control to it, and they expected, and we even asked multiple times, and they said, no, no, it flows, it just, it all flow through the, the upstream chiller. So we're trying to put 12,000 GPM through condenser water through that chiller. Now, it's within the maximum, it's lower than the maximum allowable for the chiller, so it wasn't damaging it. But what we found was it was able to do around 9,000 or 9,500, depending on which combination of chillers you had running. And it was one of those interesting pieces where you'd see and you go, okay, we were running uh, one and five with two, 
and one would be at you know, 4,500, 4,600, and the other one would be that slightly less number, you know, four, you know, 40, 4,200 or whatever it was, and it kept going because the valves didn't modulate, right? It was the flow that you could get. It was an interesting conversation uh, with our tab technician. So, um, but once again, I think they're gonna upsize the uh, motors on those, those pumps because, or in reality, open the bypass on the upstream side because there was a bypass around it. Um, yeah, your condenser water return going back to your cooling towers would be slightly colder, but in reality, you would get that flow balance and your machines would be able to be more efficient, right? So, Excuse me. yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. So. Correct. Correct. So, um, try and show it here. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, uh, it, it, technically, when one the it, the bypass would open if the upstream or downstream section wasn't opened but it was only called for if no chillers were running in the upstream or downstream section. So if you had one chiller on, chiller one, the, the, the upstream bypass would open if you were only running one chiller, but as soon as you started that second chiller, that bypass would close. So that it would, it would then flow through 6,000 through the first, that same 6,000 through the second one. If right. Three chillers running. You have uh, the combined condensed water flow for the two downstream chillers. Goes all goes through the upstream chiller. Converging, right? It was basically converging, converging into trying to flow through one, you know. Which is within the operating parameters of the chiller. Yeah. But much higher pressure drop. Which does weighs, does, weighs does that make sense? Not really, but go ahead. I understand. <laughs> Well then, no, no, no. I mean, you know, yeah, you may not be the only one, right? So when you look at, is this, is that thing going to go? No. That's, that's, that's the water we got. Yeah, yeah, no, I know, I know. It's the same concept though, because it's on both sides. So the evaporator does the same thing as the Kenster water. So um, in essence, when you, and I don't know if you can see the mouse on the screen or not. No. Okay. So, so by the time the water gets to the last, the condenser water. Condenser water, yep. Well, no, it's balanced in so that you're... you're, you're it's a 12-degree overall delta T, so the, the condensed water goes into the downstream chiller at 85, comes out at 92, goes into the upstream chiller at 92, and then comes out at 97, goes to the cooling tower. It's a 12-degree spread, 97 okay. to 85. Yeah. So, but in essence, if you, same on the evaporator side. If you look with the flow hours, arrows, right, and then on the bottom side of that diagram, and I wish I could actually make this thing work and show... There it is. Okay. See these bypass valves down here? So if this chiller was on, and only this chiller on, this bypass valve would be open, so the water would flow through it. Once you started this chiller or that chiller, because it can be any of them, the bypass valve would close, this, this chiller would open, and then all the water flow would go straight through. Right? Chilled water side and condenser water side, the same. What? Simple. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate the question, and so I'm glad you had it clarified. Does, does that make sense to everyone, or am I still a little bit gibberish? Okay. Yes, a series counterflow chiller plant is, is more yeah. complex than, than, than a... Use the sorry. microphone. Uh, series counterflow chiller plants, and it, you, you kind of have to wrap your head around it if you're used to parallel chiller plants, and you have to almost unlearn some of what you know from commissioning parallel plants because it's um, it's... It works, it functions differently, and you kind of have to look at it differently. It's more efficient, but it is, to speak to Matt's question, to the comment, absolutely it is more complex, more control valves, more, more stuff going on, more complex sequence of operation, and a lot of things you have to pay attention to in commissioning it that you wouldn't have to if you were doing a parallel plant. So, good point. No, thank you for asking, because it's a key point to what I was presenting on the pumps, because now if you think about it, right, if if this chiller, if these two chillers are on, right, the two down, these, and then this chiller, just that chiller is on, all the flow through these two, we're trying to get through one barrel. So you got double the design flow, which is a crazy amount of extra pressure drop. Justin loves setting up those systems, right, don't you? <laughs> so. <laughs> I should be careful. They'll be difficult to answer. Be careful what you wish for. Yeah. So, all right. 
So this was, uh, we talked about this, this is the condenser water pump showing that they basically were at 60 hertz, they had nothing left, and so we were getting the reduced flow in the condenser water side. And you say, well, what about the chilled water side? Well, remember back to the diagram that Jonathan showed that had all the little buildings all spread around? Chilled water pumps had enough horsepower to, to get the water where it needed to be and overcome that. The condenser water pumps did not. Um, they just weren't sized properly for the head that they might actually see in all the different scenarios that it was going to operate in. Yeah, it's a vi variable primary system, so the pumps have plenty of head pressure to, on a chill water site because they have to push all the way out to the furthest point of the terminal. So we said we're going to talk about how did we test out this chiller plant. It's 9,000 tons, and uh, basically the building's empty. There's, you know, other than the construction team and people running around like us looking at things. Um, and, and so, yeah, one of those deals where you start to look at it. And so the image on the right-hand side is uh, um, a project that we had done at a much smaller uh, uh, chiller plant. It was only 800 tons installed. So we were able to, once again, same concept where it was built for a campus, where the campus buildings were also being built, and miraculously the chiller plant was available before them. So, but we were able to get some air handling units and falsify that load through the emergency chiller connection and dial it up and dial it down to see the chiller stage up and stage down. But are you really going to do that with 9,000 tons? I mean, trying to have all that when you pull up some boilers and connect in? And uh, that's not really feasible. It wasn't in the budget, so we had to put our heads together. Um, <laughs> yeah, nuance one uh, of this, another nuance of this chiller plant was um, during construction, during design, it was intended for the owner to operate. Somewhere in construction, we were told, oh, hey, by the way, we're going to sell this plant to the utility, and they're going to operate it and sell us chilled water. OK, fair enough. Oh, we want that to happen in, it was uh, August. It ended up happening in November. But because they were still actually installing air handling units when they, in, the, in the air side, land side, and all the other places when they wanted this chiller plant, um, which then you know, made us move forward. Um, it actually was a help because the, the engineer that they use for their plants, who was the one who helped with the pre-design, after he got through his disgust of all the changes in VEs where they modified his system that he had perfected, we sat down and said, OK, how are we going to really test out this chiller plant? Um, much, most of the credit goes to him. It was good, great ideas. Um, in essence, what we thought about was, OK, I've got to see six chillers under load. We would see three occasionally. But you want to see six chillers loaded up. But do we need to see six chillers actually loaded under load in this chiller plant since they were factory witness tested? So you got to see that the chiller delivered, right? You put it on the stand, you get, it gets its design water flows on both sides, and you can actually see its performance and you have all that data. So the thought was, well, do we really need to see that again in the space? Because we've seen them all operate individually, just not six together. So we said, okay, well, what do we really, if that's the case, and the chillers have seen that, and the cooling towers have seen their load, each of them in the space running with the different chiller connections, what do we really need to test out for full load? Because that's what we kept calling it, the full load test. And it was the water. Are we sure that we can actually move six chillers worth of chilled water and condenser water through these systems and have the pumps and everything operate properly? And so that was the new full load test became the full flow test. Um, so we actually went out after hours and uh, made sure all these trends were set up for those individuals that couldn't be there at 1 and 2 a.m. and walk through this process of basically disabling the chillers from, being, from running, but opening the valves and, and just built up the water flow throughout the entire plant. The first test uh, went okay, but we found a number of issues. And so we got to go back out, it was like three nights later, um, to uh, finally see that it actually operated and it moved all the water. So it was one of those things where when you're talking about testing a chiller plant and uh, it's a small chiller plant and you have no load, you can use air handling units or something small. You can start to falsify some load. But when you get to nine, ten thousand 10,000 tons, you're talking about a crazy expense to try and add that load, right? And so this was a nice way to do it. So now I'm going to tell you that was it. There was no other issues, but that would be a lie. And so Jonathan's going to tell you about 
the next issue we had with this chiller plant. Okay, folks, now we're going to talk about low chill water delta T, killer of kilowatts, enemy of efficiency, and scourge of commissioning happiness everywhere. Wade says I should be more animated, so um, anyway. Uh, <laughs> Seriously, though, um, this is a major problem because, uh, as we mentioned, the system was designed for 16-degree chill water delta T, 42 degrees out of the plant, 58 degrees coming back in. And we were nowhere near that. We were only about halfway there. And this created a problem on two fronts, right, because uh, the utility who now owns the plant, they got to run their pumps harder because of the low delta T to deliver this, uh, uh, the same uh, chill water uh, cooling capacity. And and th that didn't make them too happy because that's not the way the, system, the plant was designed to run. And also our client, the owner, was not too happy either because the utility, they passed that, the additional pumping uh, operation cost onto the, onto the owner. So uh, the, our client was getting hit with penalty charges in his monthly utility bill, uh, which were quite substantial, but uh, which weren't, wasn't making him happy. So we really went hard at solving this problem because it would, it would solve the problem on both sides of the equation. So we started. John, we, we did tell the owner, when, it, you know, when you sell that to them and you sign the contract, they are going to penalize you as, as long as there's Delta T issues going on. So they know full, and I was like, maybe you buy a window until it gets dialed in, but they, they did not. So they got to pay a nice penalty, right? Yes, quite substantial. So uh, we were highly motivated, more than, more than we normally would be, to, uh, to solve this problem, right? So we, we went at it in kind of two different paths and kind of two sides of the same coin. The, the, the name of the game with, with solving chill water delta T, right, is make sure that uh, track down and eliminate any sources where supply water is getting into your return side without doing any work through a, a chill water cooling coil. So um, we looked for, on the one hand, we went around the, the, the site and we kind of we kind of knew places where we should look but we were looking for manual bypass valves that were installed earlier as part of the the initial piping flushing operation that may have been left open or not fully closed and we were uh, one of the big finds is what you see depicted in this picture and it was all the way up on the north end of the site underground under a manhole we found a 20 inch manual bypass valve that was not fully closed and when you look at the photograph, you can see, well, it's only about 15 degrees open. But bear in mind, this is a 20-inch butterfly valve. So even, even 15 degrees open with that butterfly, we were bypassing about 2,000 GPM of 42-degree water, water back into the return, which was killing our delta T for the system at large. So uh, we went ahead and closed that valve off. And immediately, we saw an improvement in the overall system delta T from under 9 degrees right up into the mid-12s uh, degree range, which was very encouraging. And we went around and continued to track down uh, places where we had manual bypasses open. And we found several other locations, not as big as this one, but each time we tracked down and eliminated the cause of the bypass, we saw incremental increases in our chill water delta T. Uh, so uh, we're, we're moving up closer and closer to the target. And on the other avenue, at, uh, concurrently to that, we're in a and uh, we were doing functional performance testing on all the, the large air handling units, and what we were finding is some of the air handling units, uh, the control valve was, uh, we had some malfunctions in, in the controls, so that the valve was not closing fully when uh, the, the leaving air temperature on the coil was satisfied. So we were looking, and we were aided somewhat by, by the, uh, uh, the fact that they had chill water return temperature sensors on uh, the coils, on each of the large chill water coils. Highly recommended, it was a great diagnostic tool because it allowed us to, to see and track down, okay, which coils, they're all designed for 16 degree delta T, which ones are doing only 12, 10, 9, and we found several of them. So we were able to, once we rectified those control issues, that also added to the incremental increase in the, in the chill water delta T. And, and uh, fast forward to this past Tuesday, we looked in, do we have a question? Someone have the hand up? Yep. Well, I was wanting to discuss the penalties in the relationship with the owner after, uh, you know, during, while that was going on, and then as the, during the resolution to that. Yeah, go ahead and ask it. Did, well, did they uh, rely on you as a commissioning agent to provide background information so that they could determine who's at fault? Is there anybody at fault? Is there any, what did they have damages? Did they get 
it, it didn't get that far. They, they, they were, you know, uh, unbeknownst to us in the design phase, which is why they had the gentleman do the pre-design, there was potential where it could go that route. The airport was looking for the influx of capital to do other things. Um, and so when that happened, they just, you know, there was concern from them, and they're, but it, yeah, they, they had pointed us and said, hey, lead the charge, get this fixed, right? I had another client connected to utility that was paying $110,000, $120,000 a month in low delta T charge. So it can be quite substantial. And, uh, but as Jonathan was, you were about to get to, we got on Tuesday, you got the note, go ahead. So uh, we, we looked on Tuesday and we were running at about 15.3 on our overall system chill water delta T, which is very good. Not yet at the 16 degree target, but we're within striking distance and we're kind of closing in on it. It's an incremental uh, battle. This is over a course of nine months. And this just as a side note is kind of the part of commissioning that really floats my boat, the, the investigation part, right? Following your nose, you see something that doesn't look right and track it down and fight through some frustration. And when you find the cause and you see the improvement, you say, okay, you know, that, Great, and uh, we, were, we were able to, and the owner is, is quite happy now. He sees, he sees our, the progress we're making, he sees the actions we took, and it's, uh, uh, well, you know, it's... Right. Fun, know. Funny story, when, when Jonathan called to talk to the owner and say, hey, we're seeing this number, he goes, let me look. We're at eight. And we're like, okay, we'll call you back. And uh, the, was it air side or land side? Yeah, the, the turned water out the test and balance contractor was Was doing, back out and they basically was, cranked every air handling unit yeah, valve yeah, wide open. Yeah, all so the right before we made the call, they were like, yeah, let's stick it to you. Didn't no. tell us, yeah, <laughs> keep the commissioning guy in the but, dark, but no. But that even goes to, okay, during this whole process, should the owner really be paying for these penalties when it's the construction side that's not done on everything else? We, we tried to warn them and say, hey, buy some time, try and avoid the penalty for a while. Um, but you're only allowed in so many rooms, right? You can only get into so deep in some of those conversations. Yeah, and I think the construction managers were painfully aware that, you know, if the owner's feeling that kind of pain on account of something you didn't do, you better get your act in order because, you know, they, they're going to come after you eventually, yeah. sooner than later. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't sit on it, but it wasn't, you know, it was still, didn't get to the point you were mentioning. All right. Okay. On. Happy Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> Uh, I, I know probably some of you are looking forward to a cold beverage at the end of this day, and I know I am. Um, but, uh, but basically, seriously, this uh, illustration is just meant to avoid a, uh, a, a tedious, long uh, electrical <laughs> engineering explanation, which I would probably fumble through, for I am but a humble mechanical engineer. And, uh, but basically, the point being is that uh, they have this modern uh, baggage handling system, right? So it consists of... The old systems had, you know, just fewer larger motors that moved longer conveyor belts to move the, the baggage along. This new system has many, many more smaller motors, and each motor moves it, uh, moves the baggage just a few feet along to the next section. Overall, a very efficient system, but when you have 4,000 plus motors with um, with VFDs, it is going to affect your power factor overall. And this was really noticeable when they were doing uh, testing on the emergency generation plant because they, they were finding that they were, they're just uh, getting a very poor f power factor. So what this illustrates is the KVAR is basically the, the foam on the beer. You're paying for the whole glass of beer, but in terms of the actual power you're getting, you're not getting the whole glass of beer. So basically, in response to this, the engineer of record uh, studied the problem and issued a bulletin. Uh, basically, there's some corrective measures and equipment that's gonna, that was installed that uh, improved the power factor to a point where it would be acceptable for operation of the plant. Um, so, uh, you have a, every airport terminal, you have a, a multitude of different shops, restaurants, a lot of tenants in, in, in the airside terminal, and we were not, uh, it was not in our commissioning scope to, for the commission, the AC units in, or the AC systems in all those different shops and, and tenants, but it, the, the air handling units that did provide the makeup air and the ventilation air for those tenants that was in our scope to commission. And they were having problems that came back to us because uh, the, the way the sequences of operation were originally written, they weren't really providing uh, the makeup air and the ventilation air wasn't really maintaining a steady and correct, uh, slightly positive pressurization in the airside terminal. 
And again, this is import it's important to keep out the humidity, obviously, in, in Florida in summer, but it's also important to keep it, the jet fumes out of the terminal. No one wants to walk through a modern terminal and smell jet fumes because the, the spaces have gone negative. So we, uh, we looked at some different options for tweaking the sequences of operation. And again, we, uh, we facilitated some uh, phone calls and meetings with the engineer of record and us and, and, and the BAS contractor, and we came up with uh, uh, you know, improve sequences of operation, and once we put those sequences in, in, uh, in place and implemented them, we saw a notable improvement. We had much more steady uh, pressurization and positive in, in, uh, in the tenant spaces, so that worked out well. But it was just an example where there's something that may be outside of your commissioning scope, but you may get drug into it anyway because it's, it affects uh, equipment that you're commissioning. Um, so, $3 billion project, right? It's a very, very large project. So uh, because of that, the, the contracts were let out to two different construction managers, uh, one for the air side and one for the land side, two different construction teams, two different sets of mechanical, electrical, test and balance contractors. So you have a lot of different players in, in, involved here. And I guess the lesson learned is we had to kind of uh, tailor and adjust our means and methods of communication uh, with the different uh, two teams because uh, they're, you know, they're just, uh, it's, it's just different. It's not the same for everybody, but at, by the same token, the owner is looking to us as the commissioning provider for the entire facility to kind of have a coherent commissioning process, right? And we were aided by the fact that there was a single BAS contractor that the owners contracted with to maintain the new and existing controls throughout the airport. So uh, it turned out that it was, they were a very good partner in helping us to kind of uh, come up with a, uh, a unified approach in, in spite of the fact that we had all these different, two different C, CMARs and, two, and different sets of subcontractors all with their own agenda and priorities. Uh, so uh, that was a lesson learned there. Um, parking garage, as, as mentioned before, there was an extension to the uh, parking garage, which is kind of in, in, the, uh, in the foreground of the, of the photo you see. And so what was challenging about this is not the systems themselves. It wasn't challenging technically to commission, but it was challenging. And if you look at the timing, this got turned over in the summer of 2020, and we all know what was going on that summer. Um, uh, so with the COVID uh, pandemic being in full swing, we had to figure out how are we gonna observe functional performance testing in the field while maintaining or respecting social distancing. So we had to come up with some creative solutions. We ended up uh, buying additional monitors and cables and we set it up so that basically we could all stand and look at the, the, the BAS graphics, look at the same screen without uh, breathing down each other's necks, so to speak. So that was a uh, a challenge that came up, not technical, but just shows how you kind of have to roll through things as they, as they come at you. Uh, so um, there was that. <clears throat> uh, mul multiple building, uh, so what happens with a project this large is you can't have the same level of meetings all the time. You can't have all focused meetings and you can't have all uh, big broad meetings. So we, we had to find the right balance between the two. So we ended up some of the meetings were, were very focused just between a few of the stakeholders that needed to, to, to be in a discussion, like the discussion of sequences of operation, just us and the EOR and the BAS contractor a lot of the time. And then uh, on the other hand, there were the larger meetings because we wanted to maintain a, a coherent uh, commissioning process. So we did have larger meetings with both construction managers, all, all the relevant subcontractors. Uh, you know, together to make sure that we're, we're, uh, we're all on the same page as far as where we're going with the commissioning process for the overall site. Um, so, as you would expect for a, three, uh, a, a nearly $3 billion project, there was a lot of design changes along the way. There always is, but it, there was an enormously large amount for this, uh, for this uh, project, and it was, a, it was a challenge to work through. I wish I could say there was a silver bullet to it, but there wasn't, uh, it was just a matter of, with 140 plus design revisions, every, you know, we, our, our commissioning scope was a little over 2,000 pieces of MEP equipment were in our scope, and the, the challenge was that with, with every successive uh, revision that was, design revision that was coming out, that number of uh, equipment was going up or going down. They were adding equipment, deleting equipment, adding equipment, deleting equipment, and the, the best we could do is just to try to, uh, 
try to keep, uh, do our level best to keep up because it was playing a little bit of havoc with our, 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 our checklists, not only the number of checklists and test scripts we had, but what was the content of the text, test scripts and the checklists was being affected by the number of design changes that were coming at us. And we just, uh, again, there was no silver bullet. We just have to kind of try to keep up and keep your sanity through it. And also RFI responses, uh, there were uh, 12,000 plus total for the project. Uh, they weren't all MEP, but several thousand of them were MEP. And a lot of the responses also we had to keep an eye on because they were affecting, uh, we had to tweak our checklists and, and test scripts to try to keep up with, the, with all the changes. Um, as mentioned before, uh, the PCA chiller plant has kind of two, two sides to it. It's got the, um, the uh, what you're seeing here depicted here in this is uh, the PCA units themselves, which they're, they're at each bridge, and the round uh, flex duct you see is connected to the plane to keep it cool when it's in the gate between flights. And these, these units are served by, as we mentioned before, uh, a low temperature glycol chill water system and a satellite plant that's located in the airside terminal. Uh, so the challenge was we have to commission a certain sequence of operation again for the, uh, for the main chiller plant and uh, part of that was that the BAS has to be able to monitor the, the status of these units and the control valve positions to properly modulate the pump speed back at the plant. And we found out that uh, they had no way of doing so. There was no communication between the two. And so what we had to do is kind of find uh, the person on the, own, the owner's rep that had been involved in the purchasing of these units because they were owner furnished. So we had to go to them and say, um, by the way, when you bought these units, you didn't buy any control interface. Uh, they have to talk to the BAS and they can't right now. So um, right now the, it's kind of in the works. They're um, buying back net cards that they'll install in these units. And hopefully at that point we'll be able to uh, have the BAS see what all these units are doing and be able to properly control the, the, the main, the, the, the chill water plant the way it was designed to be. Um, <clears throat> so um, resiliency testing, as Wade mentioned, we got into a little bit of this and uh, just in, in uh, just going to talk a little bit about, uh, in, about it in the context of first on the electrical power side. Um, it, take, it took the form of they had two electrical services that serve the, the, the South Terminal C. And there was, so with redundant services, there is a, a function where if you lose one service, you can swing over to the other one. And um, we did test that as a, you know, did failover scenarios to make sure that that, that happens. If you lose one service, you can go to the other one. And also, the, the, another layer of failover is if you lose both services, then you got to go and, and to your... Uh, to your emergency power plant, and we did both functional performance testing, uh, including the fuel oil system. And I, I have to emphasize that because uh, it's kind of overlooked sometimes, and it's um, uh, it's something that's important because you could have a hundred thousand gallons of fuel oil underground in your underground storage tanks, but if it doesn't get to your day tank, your day tank runs dry and the generator stops. It's not much good, so. That was part of it. And we also did, uh, uh, as Wade mentioned, the, the chiller plant is N plus one. It's got a standby chillers, pumps, cooling towers. We did all those failover scenarios. Uh, the fan arrays, there's, all the air handling units have multiple supply fans, and we did failover scenarios for those fan arrays. What happens when you, when you lose a fan? Do the other ones pick up the slack? So that was kind of the extent of the, the resiliency testing we did as it applies to this project. So with that, we appreciate you being here, and we will absolutely entertain most questions. Justin, most. Um, no, well, any questions or? You had mentioned the delta Z of the condenser water as it moves from the downstream to the upstream chiller. On the chill water side, what was your delta Zs and set points, and how did you control that? Good question. So, so, in essence, it was we talked about the condenser water side and set points. What is the chilled water uh, set points and split for the recording? So, um, so with a series counterflow plant, which which makes it appealing, it, it makes it more efficient. Is that it basically splits your chill water delta T? Okay, so you got uh, a 16 degree delta T. The upstream chiller takes it from 58 degrees down to 50. The downstream chiller takes it from 50 down to 42. So, what you're basically doing is uh, 
the you don't instead of having one compressor trying to do all that head from to get from 58 down to 42 they basically split the they split the the work the two com the compressors in the upstream and downstream chillers split the work and so it's so and part of load balancing is how they balance out the load between upstream and downstream chillers is they vary the um, the the set point of the upstream chiller is the the initial set point is 50 degrees but if it turns out the upstream chiller is not loaded up as much as the downstream chiller it will reset down to 49 and then down to 48 until the load the RLA between the upstream and downstream balance out within five percent so that was part of our functional performance testing and confirmation of that load balance which for the ones that took an hour was very fun to watch like watching paint dry yeah <laughs> sir yeah, uh, what sort of uh, site access issues did you have, like to the to the various departments, I guess, within the building, and how did you solve those? So, um, yes, there is absolutely access issues. Uh, one of the things, if you're going to work on these, is build up enough time because you have to go through their security process and interviews and training, et cetera, before you, before you can get badged. Uh, different levels of badging, um, that whether you can escort someone, whether you can't, and so. It adjusted, I'm giving you time to think your full answer, it, it adjusted through construction to when, you know, the inaugural flight went, then there was a lot more lockdown of different areas um, and required different level of badging. But Jonathan was, Jonathan was the one who had to deal with all the different badging for people, so I'll let him, now that he's got an answer in the head, his head, he'll tell you. Yeah, so basically we had uh, six, six members on our commissioning field testing team, and uh, they all had to become, get badges to have access to, to the airside and landside terminals. And uh, I had to be the signatory, so I had to go through and kind of uh, help them submit all their paperwork, and they do an extensive background check. And obviously, for obvious reasons, um, they want to be careful about who they have walking around, especially what they call the sterile area, the area that's past the security checkpoint. When you get out into the, you have to work in the areas where the, out by the gates, um, we all had to be badged, and we all had to uh, understand all the parameters. You know, only one person can go through a door uh, at a time, all that stuff, being vigilant and not letting people follow you through the security doors. So it did add to our, our time, and we kind of had to figure that in to our functional performance testing uh, schedule. Yeah. And there was a couple spaces where even with the badge, we still had to be uh, escorted in terms of Im you know, immigration customs in certain areas of the yeah, airport. Customs so. and border control, sometimes we were only allowed there a few hours a day, and we had to figure that in too and plan those in advance and sometimes work overnight if we had to. Sir? Hey, I've got some questions on the low delta T problems you're having. Um, so for the coils out in the system, like on these air handlers, uh, it looks like you might have had a sort of an energy valve that gives you a little more control and a little more information on uh, how you can control them. And obviously you mentioned the test and balance issue, which definitely would contribute. Um, but did you find that a lot of these air handlers just weren't set up for delta T control and they needed to go back and reconfigure? Or? No, they were, they were set up proper. They were, des they were designed properly, and they were selected. The coils were selected for 4258, but um, in some cases, just for, um, you know, there were malfunctions with the valve. Sometimes some of the valves had some dirt in, in, in the seat of the control valve, wasn't enabling it to co close completely. Sometimes it was a dirt issue. Sometimes it was a functional issue with the actuator itself. But, um, you know, the, the system was designed for the 16 degrees. It was just a matter of functionally getting us there and again the the having a chill water return temperature sensor on on each coil of those coils was a tremendous help for us to, to track down and diagnose problems and also it remains for the 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 uh, maintenance that they can look at remotely on the screen and see almost at a glance if when they have a sick coil they'll see one that's getting you know instead of getting 58 degrees back maybe you're getting only 50 degrees back and they say oh i better go check that one we got a problem there so it so, and a lot of it is also timing, right? So we talked about the change in ownership. I flew out early October, um, and like I said, they turned the plan over early November. Um, we were maybe tested through a third of the air handling units, so even if they were, they were programmed, some of them weren't, some, you know, left open, some of them forced open, we hadn't been through every air handling unit, and that becomes, you know, with, when, you, when you talk about a system that has miles of piping as opposed to feet, um, there's a lot of issues, and those 
a lot of the air handling and it's become you know death by paper cut right so as we kept going through and finding those issues and trying to correct them it, it helped but that wasn't the big bulk of the delta t issue it's a piece to it right yeah so, again it was a very incremental process there was no big win other than a 20 inch valve we found open it, all those all those uh improvements came about incrementally kind of one yep. one step at a time any other questions seeing uh all right justin Wait, I, I didn't see it. When you were showing the condenser water, the, the P&I diagrams or, or uh, the scale down, did you guys have any flow measurement devices or was everything purely gone off of RLA? And uh, obviously we'll, we'll talk later about the bypass situation because that's, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, but but did, did you have any secondary methods for staging based on flow? There, in terms of staging on flow, is only if it exceeded the chiller fl operating chiller maximum flow. Um, there was an actually good quality differential pressure that sensor that was added to the chiller just across the chiller barrel that reported to the BAS, so we could actually see the DP across those and try and keep those in range as well. Um, but yeah, it was uh, some of the things that had been VE'd out would have made life a lot easier. And, and there were some flow meters that we had to work with, but not nearly as many as were in the original design concept. Uh, uh, a lot of them were VE'd out, and uh, we, we missed them later on when it came time to troubleshoot. Yeah, and then a couple of them were in the standard best position we can get it in, which then leaves, you know, tab technicians to really figure it out and get it adjusted and calibrated so it will actually read somewhat normal. You had a question, sir? So in your integrated system test, how long did you do your blackout test, and then did you have any problems at, at post occupancy? Have they had any blackouts since then, and did everything recover okay? I'm, I'm trying to think. So uh, we're both mechanical. Uh, Danny Hahn, who's our electrical, is the one who's out there. You probably know how long he was out there for. I'd... Um, some of the integrated systems tests were problematic and had to be done a second time uh, to get it to get it right, and uh, so. Uh, but I know that since then they haven't had any major events, uh, uh, but at least they'll be ready for them. Uh, I understand before I moved to Florida, the eye of Hurricane Charlie came straight through Orlando International Airport. So evidently they learned some lessons from that and they want to be ready should that happen again, which so, is only a matter of when, not if. And, and part of that approach, I don't want to say we you know, sectioned out, but during the testing of the, the, the transfer switches, we were trying to make sure that we were each transfer switch and downstream was functionally performance tested to make sure that it, that piece works. When we got into the integrated systems test, if something failed beyond that, that was a new failure point, if you will. So we tried to make sure that we were functionally performance testing out each part and component in sections so that when we went to go to the integrated systems test, we weren't really getting um, as many surprises as you might if you had just said, hey, we're going to kill the power and we haven't really functionally tested out your transfer switch and down and, 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 and running on uh, backup power. So, um, and also the testing between the different utility sources and stuff. So it's, it's, not, uh, it's not a day's work, it's, it takes time. And then if you find issues, it takes longer. But uh, yeah, absolutely crucial and to make sure that they have that, that power. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, how big was your uh, commission? Yeah, so that's it. So I asked how big was the commissioning team and how did we split it between land side and air side? And the interesting piece is when you think of that, some a lot of people say is, and, and, and uh, we did this on another project where Jonathan really led and, and the mechanical side and then Danny was more on the electrical side and Jonathan would pull him in. And so sometimes the owner, they're like, well, two guys commissioned our building, which we all know is not true. I think we had, um, I think it was 13 or 14 different people put time on the project uh, throughout the entire phase of it um, to try and support whether that's writing checklist or looking at submittals or uh, doing QC, doing other parts and pieces. And uh, so, but with that, it's it's a, uh, and then for the split for the air side, land side. Yeah, at, at the peak, we had uh, two teams working concurrently testing mechanical equipment, one on the air side terminal, one on the land side terminal. and. Uh, Luckily, we had sufficient support from the contractors to, to kind of go on two parallel concurrent tracks of testing uh, to, to get, get through them all because there was a 
as mentioned before, there was a very large uh, amount of uh, MEP equipment we had to get through. Yeah, and it's two teams on each side. So it's initially there was four tests going on at any one point in time to try and make sure that we got through all the systems and equipment. Any other questions? Hi, everyone. Hopefully you didn't have to step out for a phone call, but the chiller plant or the chillers themselves, were those controlled by a DCC contractor or were they performed, uh, controlled by a chiller, you know, controller from the manufacturer? Uh, they, they tied into the BAS and the BAS was controlling, you know, the, the normal that you would typically see, which is the enable, disable, let the chiller control its own functions. But we did talk about, you know, with the RLA, um, in, in answer to Brad's question, which was uh, the, the temperature of the, of the upstream would be adjusted to get that load balancing, and the BAS system was controlling that as well. Thanks. So. Yeah. Uh, did, was Hanson responsible for baggage handling, uh, baggage handling system commissioning, special systems, things like that, or did you guys end up subconsulting that, or was that handled by a separate company? That was handled by a separate company. The commissioning of the baggage handling itself was a separate company. Yeah. It's uh, it's an interesting system depending on what you get. So, and it really is motors and belts, but there's a lot more to it that you have to make sure that it gets done. So, yeah. All right. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, enjoy your Cinco de Mayo.